I'm, I've been, I've had jitters for months uh, for, you know, having the chance to come here. Uh, thank you so much for New York Times and Qatar uh, Museums for inviting me to give me this opportunity to speak about my uh, experiences using digital media in, as an artist. Um, and to have my work exhibited upstairs. Uh, I have um, worked with, uh, you know, my introduction is quite long, and um, I realize uh, with the time uh, that we have, or that I have available, that I'm going to have to shorten it a little bit. I wanted to talk uh, about what I did before I started to work with digital art. And uh, one of the reasons, uh, well, what I was doing in the 80s, I started as a painter, and uh, I also was introduced to interdisciplinary art philosophy. So in that context, I was interested in how to uh, activate the public, find out how uh, participation would be possible with a public that seemed very passive, uh, consumer-like in many places of the world, and uh, in the tradition of art, uh, also, you know, going back to the modernist, uh, the early founders of modernism, uh, finding out how to achieve the goal that, uh, for instance, Bauhaus or the Futurist or the, uh, the Dadaist, um, uh, all these movements that are very important for modern art, uh, Duchamp and so on, uh, how to create that ideal of a society where art is integrated into everyday life. So when the internet came in the 90s, um, it became a kind of a natural platform for somebody who had worked uh, with performance music, video painting, and urban planning, and uh, also I had worked with fashion. Um, as, a, um, as a medium, because in the interdisciplinary uh, sector there was all these art forms, but fashion was not included, and for some reason I, I thought that that was relevant. So, I'm going to... Sorry, I have to play around a little bit with my notes. Uh, yeah, in my lecture I'm going to, uh, or my presentation, I'm going to speak about the five central ideas that I've been working on for the last 25 years. And the first is uh, art interfaces. And I just have to see if I can move it a bit forward here. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. So, uh, art interfaces became a way to create uh, a multi-surface uh, content that would exist on many uh, surfaces simultaneously. And uh, I was in Paris, originally from Norway, I moved to Paris in the early 90s, and uh, for some coincidence, the uh, Syndic de Créateur de Mode in Paris took interest in my fashion, and I ended up there rather than in the Venice Biennale where I thought I, I wanted to go. And uh, I thought then that I would... Um, uh, the sound was off here, sorry. Uh, I thought then I, that I would uh, use the fashion platform as a place to... Uh, oh my God. Let's see what happened. Yeah, okay. A, a place to um, disseminate ideas in a in a much uh, faster speed than what was uh, used in the fashion world. And uh, the images I just showed before uh, was actually uh, the first interactive fashion collection ever made. Uh, you saw the circles that, um, that uh, was uh, uh, kind of a reference to the Dadaist or the Futurist. And uh, I thought about the internet as a way to, to a place to navigate information in a new way, uh, create uh, other passages from one information to another. And uh, in 1996, uh, I created Cyber Couture. And this was uh, kind of a project that I call today the first hybrid art project that I did. Uh, I had, um, this is a kind of a multilateral navigational system 
one of the first interfaces I made. And the cyber would be the art. And uh, there I presented art projects, uh, things that I did myself, videos and so on. And I also uh, worked with, uh, collaborated with architects, artists. Uh, I was working with John Novell and uh, also with, um, with a kind of a cross-disciplinary content, trying to, to find the creative uh, impulses of the city. I work with identities and in this uh, interactive interface, people could download the uh, content, uh, what they would find affinity to. I, I'm losing the thing, so oh, I hope somebody could help me. Um, and, um, uh, sorry. And in this way, um, create a kind of a, uh, a next step, um, create a kind of um, uh, uh, a next step uh, of the art that when people would uh, wear these clothes in a remote community, say for instance in uh, Japan or in Norway or, or in Paris, I can, do you think I can use this? Okay. All right. I'm sorry about all of that technical thing. Uh, yeah, that they could wear the the clothes and became a become a performance artist uh, in their local community, and in that way actually disseminate the knowledge uh, through other filters than the you know the traditional way that we were receiving knowledge. I also work with educational. Uh, aspects uh, with the museums, institutions and so on. And here I created a, an interface for um, children to get involved with um, technology and how to, uh, it's actually a paper, paper doll that they can, um, they can design both sides of the paper at the same time and print it out. And, um, and I also work with the uh, um, uh, let me see. Yeah, the the kind of political, ethical, and educational aspects of cyber couture, because it became uh, a project that was um, it was you know uh, an art project. It was a kind of business model. It was uh, a fashion future brand, and so on. So. Uh, it's really was interesting for me as an artist that I was uh, immersing myself in many of the uh, problems that we in this conference actually are talking about. Uh, many of the same ideas are are tangent to what we are concerned about here. Um, in uh, 2007, I was invited by the Stavanger Art Museum to make a, an exhibit, and I, I started to explore a 3D sculpture. And in one of the sculptures that you see in this video, I created a replica of one of the famous uh, collections in the museum. And so uh, people could um, um, you know, watch the video, and all of a sudden they, they saw that collection which they knew inside. Uh, what I did is that I created an installation inside of the same room in the museum. And uh, people there could, um, they could sit down and they could uh, work on the interface that I had created. So here, you see, I introduce my content, this, the sculptures, into the historic uh, perspective of these paintings that everyone in the city knew, the kind of uh, local identity of the city. And uh, people could uh, navigate around in the virtual context uh, what's important about this work is that uh, it's the first time that I created a kind of a, a, a link between the virtual world and the, and the real world and a way to look at information and process information in new ways. In 2004, I was in, invited by Centre Pompidou to be part of a, a group show. Uh, and I created female interfaces, both as a console where people could sit in front and, and play, like, uh, much like in this presentation here, uh, and also a performance series where uh, myself and other invited artists uh, were using suits that were um, full of technology and sensor-based uh, 
uh, gadget, almost like a synthesizer. And uh, it was um, uh, a way to immerse in space, a new way to, to use oneself, one body, etc., in order to create a kind of a live experience. A little bit related to the MTV, you know, but with a new way to, to play with music and images. So in um, 2009, when kind of like the rest of the world started to become interested in interactive art, I started and kind of a immersed myself into animating 3D sculptures. So uh, this was a, a kind of a strange idea. I just had the instinct that I wanted to do it. And when I started to explore it, I understood that uh, there's, you know, why had nobody animated sculptures or paintings before? Why were we used to these medias? And uh, my conclusion became that no, it had not been accessible to us before. There had not been tools. So the digital tools gives us new possibilities, uh, new ways to explore and to understand what visual language is. And um, I also thought that the, the forms that I made, they became a kind of symbolic forms. This one is about dripping paint, you know, like as an in Jackson Pollock painting, a kind of reference to what is going on a lot in, in painting in the last 50 years. And uh, at the same time, I thought that, you know, the symbols, when I put them together in different constellations, they, uh, they came up with new meaning. And I thought much about the hieroglyphics uh, in the ancient languages, uh, how, um, you know, how I imagined they were virtual concepts that people would, that they would put them together and depending on how they were put together, it would come a new meaning. So I kind of glimpsed on a, what I think is a kind of a future of language, language evolving uh, into 3D exploration and animation and so on. We will start to grasp concepts uh, from, you know, from a different source, not the linear way. We will kind of more holistically, we'll understand uh, what is at stake in a different way. I'm not sure I'm right, but that's where people call me the futurist, you know, like I'm thinking about those things. Um, let me just look at my notes a second. Yeah, also the, the aspect of virtual is... Uh, you know, in new technology, we talk a lot about virtual, virtual. And uh, I thought about virtual as the oldest, you know, the essence of art or the essence of a society is all in virtuality. Like a, a constitution has no meaning unless we virtually understand it in our, in our minds. So I brought in Venus, uh, an old artifact uh, 36,000 years ago. And... Um, uh, thinking about uh, you know how art always have, have been central to every every society for survival for the tribe to procreate and um, the Venus in this installation here is it's um, it's Venus today what can Venus or who is Venus today because we can clone DNA we can um, uh, yeah, we can clone we can ma manipulate DNA and we can, um, yeah, we can have children and others uh, and other people and, and send the seeds around by FedEx and so on. You know, so um, Venus or, or our society is a completely different society today than, than it has ever been. Um, to present these, in these uh, animated forms, I also started to think about structures, architectural or sculptural structures. And, um, uh, and I started to work with a company in Norway that assisted me, also one of my sponsors here, uh, to think about digital mapping, how to put a lot of screens together, how you could uh, 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 program, like in this tunnel sculpture, a complete uh, immersive experience, like. I imagine that I would be inside of a sculpture while it's being painted, no, inside of a painting while it's being painted, 
and all the surfaces and the, everything that an artist sees when they work is present in that, in that work. And uh, in uh, 2011, I presented uh, this Stargate first as an independent pavilion in Venice, Biennale. And um, actually, it's upstairs. And uh, I never got to build a tunnel. I really want to, but uh, the Stargate is still uh, a way to understand what happens when you step into that space. Uh, it's also, you know, that uh, art and architecture and urbanity today is like uh, if you go to Shanghai or you go uh, even here in Doha, you see that uh, buildings are changing light and so on. So the buildings are now becoming canvases. And I also explored ways for the public to be able to influence uh, what is going on with the kind of simple interfaces and so on. In uh, 2014, I was invited by uh, Centre Pompidou to uh, make an uh, immersive interactive exhibition, uh, which you see here as a, as a 3D model. And uh, uh, titled the Art Avatar, it was a kind of, it was a project that combined a lot of the ideas that I worked with for 20 years, uh, but also with the uh, uh, cutting edge technology, new technology. One of the central ideas was to uh, make a real visible link between real space and virtual space. So I created an exhibition, uh, 350 square meter, with a virtual mirror where you could actually view the whole exhibition playing live in virtual space. And uh, this little uh, rotating object here, I call it an app. Like, you know, you would go on your iPhone and, and download an app, and, but here actually you can go inside of it and uh, uh, start to interact in the place. Uh, Santa Pompidou uh, are spending some, some energy trying to get hold of the, the, the young people because a lot of museums around the world are facing a problem with um, an aging public. So, you know, the young today are very tech savvy. They, uh, not only the young, but you know, they are especially tech savvy. So they are doing 100 characters in Sims, they, they understand Oculus Rift, they, you know, they can, uh, everyone with the phone today actually can take pictures, make films, and so on and so on. You know what it is. So the museum can actually, uh, they actually have an educated audience that uh, can do a lot of things. And the Art Avatar is about that. Uh, what I wanted to do here is that I wanted to bring my vocabulary in as an artist. I say, this is Pia Mirvel's art. And uh, I created an interface where they could use my alphabet and start creating uh, their own versions. And so what happened in the space is that uh, you know, the, the public was quite happy to, to interact, but we also looked at the content that they were creating when, while they were present in the installation. And we also looked at what people would, would do. You know, they became performers in a way that also contributed to the content of the exhibition. So, let me see if there was, I think this is the only place where I have a, lit, a little bit extra time <laughs> in my presentation. Uh, after uh, Santa Pompidou, I was, um, was kind of wondering what to do, and I went back to uh, some of the paintings that I had done in the 80s and the 90s, and uh, which kind of served as schematics for a future where uh, interfaces would, or surfaces on uh, art would become sensory-based and interactive. And uh, I started to make wands. Wands are also in the, in the exhibition upstairs. And so wands became the first generation smart sculptures. Um, and um, I was using uh, 3D printing and, um, and uh, I was using uh, 
uh, a lot of technology inside, programming and so on. But I show this image because you know, 2015 is the year when the, the personal robot became sort of like a, a concept in the public, uh, just like the, the personal computer did in the early 90s. And so we are really at a, at a, at a breaking point where uh, we are developing relationships with machines. We already have a relationship with machines, with our, the, what we carry around, but now we have machines that are actually can respond to us, can recogni recognize our faces, can recognize our voices, our emotions, and so on. And um, so, uh, so once it's really about this first step of understanding the kind of potential with the smart sculpture, you know, that there is um, there's programming to be done. Here I'm, I'm touching, you know, and getting reactions. The ones are introducing themselves uh, with their names to us: hybrid love, uh, transhuman, and biomiss, and so on. It's a little bit for fun, but at the same time, they're using Morse code to to transmit us the messages. So, um, uh, yeah. So in the sculptures, there are these little. Uh, elements that uh, that pick up if there's one person in the room or if there's uh, many and in future uh, smart sculptures I really want to explore this potential to say okay when there is uh, uh, daytime and only three people this will happen but maybe at nighttime when there's hundred people they, it, they turn into some kind of rave party I don't know <laughs> so you know, there's, there's many ways you can go with technology. It's all about parameters and what you want to happen and what you, what you can imagine. And this goes also for uh, urban space and, you know, uh, a, a hotel, a conference and so on. I also had the chance to uh, work with uh, three robotic arms in this, uh, this installation. Uh, I created a soft shell. Um, from PVCs and reflective materials and human hair. The, um, the, the v visitors that came to, to the exhibition in Paris, say, especially the young, they sort of like embraced this, uh, these robotic forms, much like they would embrace a, a puppy or, or a, a cozy toy. And uh, there was no real problem between them, the, the excitement, the meeting between them. But what I really want to suggest uh, in, this, um, in this work is uh, it's a kind of um, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> God, I lost my point, excuse me a second. Um, yeah, we, we might uh, imagine a new chapter in kinetic art or uh, we can um, also think about how people will personalize their robots in the future. They want them to look a certain way. They might uh, build parts for them, 3D print them, custom made them, and so on. So it's like, it's a new surface that arrives in our contemporary world. Uh, also, it could be that uh, people will commission haute couture clothes for their robots or, you know, or sculptures for the robots. It's kind of interesting in many levels. Uh, and also that, you know, the, the fact that the information that comes from robots and surveillance and all of this uh, creates a kind of, a, you know, negative aspects too that we are scared about. And uh, so I think that it's, um, it's very important that artists engage in these kind of processes in order to... Uh, to uh, work towards the human potential. We don't like, you know, let the machines be the potential, but it's really the human potential that we want to, to enhance. Uh, my last part of the presentation is uh, something that I am trying to put together, as I'm always looking for technology partners and people who could help me to build what I'm doing. I, st I start looking at uh, uh, the region where I come from in Norway that is uh, Stavanger, which has a lot of uh, oil production and NASA technology that they made for the seabed in North Sea. And so I looked at the region that has a lot of innovation and, and production facilities, and I tried to tap into that and work with the, the, you know, with the, the mayors 
the industry leaders and uh, with the uh, with educational sector and so on, and, and really working towards a kind of uh, inspirational model where you can engage knowledge, build knowledge through all these partners uh, to strengthen an identity and a region. Here it's wind and um, they are not really finished, it's just so like sketches of what could be done. Um, but it's really uh, a truly interdisciplinary approach to art, trying to think about art as an initiator in the beginning of a process where we take care of the aesthetics while we also uh, work on other aspects of, of the needs of a, a culture growing or a society growing. Um, I also had interest from a, a city inland, and um, what I would like to say here, I forgot to say, is that all these sculptures harvest energy. So it's also about that, you know, like how can we create new solutions, how can we make it interesting, and how can those, um, you know, this harvesting of energy models uh, s make spin-offs in their communities where people can start thinking like, oh, there's other possibilities, we can make this and this and this and this. And so uh, around these sculptures there will be a kind of um, uh, incentive to, to, for people to, to move on. And I, I have to admit that this one uh, was, I was really thinking about the beach line uh, here in Doha. I don't know how it is here in the summer, but I thought about these uh, sun trumpets, as I call it. They, are, um, they have a solar panel, and I wanted the panels to follow the sun, kind of like in an organic way, like, a, like you know, we see flowers in nature. And um, also I thought about how traditionally we used to measure time after the sun, and so here, I thought that the different position could kind of announce uh, the sun's position during the day. And uh, not that this is the music, it's just a kind of test. <laughs> but, you know, to say, okay, now the sun is on the highest place of, the, of its passage through the sky. And uh, also in these um, installations, it's, uh, I thought about, you know, the electricity that is being harvested there. It could be used for different things, like especially lighting and video events and different, you know, uh, interesting things happening inside of the, the space, even cooling or heating if that was necessary. So um, it's, uh, it's just an kind of an idea of how you could uh, work with energy and Again, it would be a cross-disciplinary uh, project. So, uh, to come to my conclusion, is that I have traveled around the world uh, and, you know, met a lot of different people in many different communities, and uh, a lot of the same uh, language is used around, just like in this conference. There's a global necessity for new ideas that solve problems, a wish for a stronger cultural identities from the passage from ancient to hypermodern transitions, for renewed urban planning ideas in booming cities and urban center, a need for sustainable ideas for cleaner energy, better food sourcing, education for all, and uh, transforming communities from poor to wealthy, initiating green cultural travel. So, um, I have to thank you. I, I know my presentation has been a little bit uneven, so <laughs> I have to thank you for bearing with me here. Uh, uh, digital technologies are, as, as we speak, at the forefront of millions of small renaissance projects all over the globe. Social networks makes it easier for people to organize and to get smaller communities to embrace and try solutions. The face of art, architecture, and design is changing rapidly with new and flexible production tools. Virtual tools let us, let us visualize how things can look and input data to predict how things might work. We are better equipped to problem solve the challenging we are facing and better, with better data, we can make more informed and sustainable this, uh, decision. Uh, I have made this paper available for, for anyone who wants it. It's uh, at the desk outside uh, when you, just when you 
enter the conference area. And uh, I thank you again for all the attention. And uh, um, I hope to talk to you afterwards. And uh, I will be upstairs in the exhibition after lunch sometime. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.